what makes childlike wonder so inspiring? I remember having a lot more curiosity, enthusiasm, and big dreams as a child than I now have and experience as an adult. But why? And how can we get back in the groove? This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 403. Rediscover wonder, inspiration, and joy with John O'Leary. Good morning, I am Jeff Sanders, and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. My guest today is a popular motivational keynote speaker, author, and podcaster. He was actually featured on this show in episode number 317, where he shared his incredible personal story that is in his first book, On Fire. He is back again to discuss his latest book, In Awe, and share a refreshing take on rediscovering childlike wonder. Now here is my interview with John O'Leary. Hey, Jeff Sanders, how are you, sir? I am doing well. Uh, You were on this podcast about 18 months ago, and a lot has happened in the world in the last 18 months. So I want to do a small recap on you and your experience. What has happened for you in the last year and a half or so? Well, the way you framed the question reminds all of us that our world is completely different than it was when we woke up 18 months previously. So that what I'm about to share here is nothing new to so many of your listeners, but my job completely changed. I'm a motivational speaker. I used to be on a flight probably four different times a week, two nights out a week, a couple hundred thousand miles a year. Uh, I have only traveled three times in the last 18 months or so. I used to be away from home a lot. Now I've made dinner for my kids, well, looking back at the year, about 360 nights consecutive, breakfast about 360 mornings consecutive. My grandmother passed away due to COVID. My, my father has become more sick due to COVID. He is struggling with Parkinson's disease. We've struggled financially. We've built new business models. We've seen that the world was always longing for hope and inspiration and togetherness, and they have never longed for it more than they have over the previous 18 months. And so although the world has changed profoundly, I think what I'm most proud of is we were able to not run from that change, but embrace it and really do meaningful work over the previous 12 to 18 months. Yeah, that's incredible. I I, I can't imagine what it'd be like to be traveling that much and then have the whole thing just disappear like that. I mean, my my business had some sort of that change, but it sounds like you had that much more dramatically. Uh, What what do you think helped you the most in terms of, you know, making those shifts? Because obviously when when we face those kinds of radical overnight changes, like that can be pretty daunting to have to face. So what did you do you think that that helped you kind of get through that in a way that wasn't going to just kind of destroy your, your mindset or have you just feel like there wasn't any way forward? Right. So when, when the pandemic first started spreading and when we had to send people home from the offices, you know, we, we manage a team of seven here. And primarily the income for that is coming through some coaching and consulting. But the lion's share comes from John being on the road speaking to large audiences. But I, I wanted to retain them. And so we sent them home to do great work from their houses. But we also sent them home, them home with a journal. And the journal had two words on it. Grace which is really important to offer to one another and the reflection in the mirror every day before the pandemic, during the pandemic and after the pandemic. So grace was a big part of our success in 2020, now 2021. But the other word that really I expected them to tether their behavior to was excellence. So we needed, we knew we needed, even before the world really profoundly changed, we knew we would need a lot of grace to do it well, to lead that change, to embrace whatever came our way, but also excellence to show up even when we did not feel like it. So those two monikers were things that led us through, but ultimately t- toward what? You know, like the business was all around speaking and that that changed. For all of us individually, we have a mission statement organizationally. So we take time within our own business and we teach other businesses how to do this as well, to have a personal mission statement. So mine, whether I'm feeling like I'm on top of the world or feeling like I'm beat down by the world, Jeff, my mission statement is I choose to thrive because. So I encourage your listeners to do likewise. I choose to thrive because, and then fill in the blank. And you ask yourself that question enough and you'll come up with the answer to it. So the reason that I choose to thrive even over the previous 18 months is because this is very personal, but it was very important because God demands it. My family deserves it. The world is starved for it let's roll. No excuses. So for me, when the world was spinning seemingly out of control, 
I wanted to make sure that I and my team members were very clear that we were going to lead through this with grace and excellence. We were going to tether our behavior toward our mission statement. And the third and the final thing is we were going to make sure the kids at home knew that the work we did during the good days was also going to be the work we did during the more difficult days. My wife and I were very clear that, you know, I, I know of many couples that came home and they really struggled with one another and they struggled with the headwinds of the pandemic and the, the recession that we had felt for the first couple of months. And many of us continue to feel, but we wanted them to see our faith lived out and we wanted them to see it lived out generously. And so we, we made a commitment right after my last conversation with you, actually, 18 months ago, there was a book coming out back then called In Awe. And for a, a speaker or an author, the, the first few weeks of sales, that's where you really make your hay, man. That, that's where the money's the best. The articles are being written. You hit the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal list. People are buying it in droves. But we wanted our kids to realize the message mom and dad preached of generosity was not only to be lived out when life was easy, but maybe even more importantly, when life was hard. So my wife and I made a commitment to give 100% of the proceeds from In Awe to a charity that we love called Big Brothers and Big Sisters. And uh, through that decision, we were able to cut a check to Big Brothers and Big Sisters for $30,000 during a time when it would have benefited us to hold on to that. So yeah, the, the world changed mightily. How did we grow with it? By remaining true to our core values, by having our mission draw us forward, and by remaining generous even when we didn't feel like it. That's powerful. Yeah, that takes a lot. It's incredible to be able to have that kind of commitment even in the difficult times, which is really, yeah, the, the test of most of our, our principles is figuring out how to apply them all the time. Uh, so speaking of that, let's get to the book you just mentioned, which is In Awe, Rediscover Your Childlike Wonder to Unleash Inspiration, Meaning, and Joy. I love the title because it. I think for me, it just speaks to things I want in my life, which I think is powerful in and of itself. So what was the inspiration for you to write this particular book here? <laughs> well, everybody get comfortable. Pour yourself a tall drink or a hot cup of coffee because <laughs> it was an iterative process. It was seeing the world through my lens and recognizing that there's a better way to do it all. And this really began back in 2015. And the one thing you are not supposed to talk about on a podcast is politics. Mm. So let's just talk politics right now and offend the entire audience. <laughs> but I was watching this debate between our two leaders. One of them was going to rule this country, lead this country, and in no small way shape the entire world. And I was watching how they were talking over one another. They were not listening to one another. They were yelling at one another. And one of my kids actually said, Dad, why are they so childish? <laughs> this one of my kids calling out this truth that many of us did not see because we only had one horse in that race. We, we already knew who we wanted to win. And so we saw the greatness of our candidate and somehow uh, the weaknesses of the other. My kids saw life through this lens of truth which was able in real time back in 2015, I believe, to call out, what, what are these people doing? Why are they being so childish? And, and then I left shortly after that debate, flew into a, a beautiful property in Hawaii, actually. And I was speaking to the folks in charge of this meeting. And I said, man, how's the view outside? How's the beach? And this guy says to me, John, we've been here three days and haven't yet gone outside. And like, I get the work aspect. I, I get preparing for something, but here you are in paradise and you haven't had the opportunity in 72 hours to pull back the curtains, to put on the flip-flops, grab a pair of shorts and, and feel life again. And so all these experiences, in addition to seeing adults sit in the room with their arms crossed and kind of beat down by the day, then I would compare all of that, Jeff, to children, not only my kids, but kids in general, and the way they step into a hotel room and start bouncing on beds. The way as soon as they walk into that room, they beg their parents to take them out of that room so they can go to the beach. The way as a speaker, if you ask a question, adults don't always raise their hands, but kids, they raise their hand before you ask a question. They skip in and out of classrooms. Their life is filled not with childish behavior, but with childlike joy. And so the question I asked was, man, what is it that little kids have that leads to their joy, their zest for life, their creativity, their innovation, their sense of belonging, their vibrancy for life that we adults lose? What triggered that? And how do we return to that? If we are able to, what might happen in our lives? So th that's where in awe came from. Just wondering, man, wh why are these kids the way they are and how can I be more like them? So does the phrase in awe then be, mean in awe of, of the childlike behavior? Is that what we're, we're striving for here? So it's really the alpha and the omega. It's, it's both the beginning and the end. I think it's a childlike behavior that allows us to see life differently. 
But the benefit of this is we get to step into the day with childlike behavior, which is not childish. It's more passionate. It's seeing things for the first time. And for the listeners who have children or cousins, nieces or neighbors that might be little, if you take a walk by yourself around the block, you're back at the front door in four minutes. You grab some five-year-old nephew and four weeks later, you finally made that same walk because every rock is intended to be flipped over. They're looking <laughs> up at the trees and, my God, I think I just saw a rainbow. No, it's not a rainbow. Oh, look at the clouds. That, that, that one looks like a, like a horse. And everything is just awesome. It's like the Lego movie, man. Everything is awesome. You know, there's a reason why they sing it. They sing it tongue in cheek. Everything is awesome. But as we progress through life, we realize how far from awesome it is, how wrong the Democrats or the Republicans are, how disappointed I am in my childhood or my behavior and my sales car, my lack of sales car, whatever the thing is. And we go through life not only with a little bit less joy, but a lot less awesome. So I I, I want to remind people what happens when you step into life with awe. It changes everything. Yeah, it certainly does. It was funny because I had highlighted a passage in in the book that I wanted to read. I think you just said it almost verbatim, which is what I what I um, highlighted here was: what if we could discard the negative expectations and adopt the lens of a young child who expects everything to be awesome? And I feel like that is just like for me that speaks volumes to me because I've used the word awesome my whole life, and I have a three year old daughter, and I've been like I use that word with her all the time. I think there's an interesting, like very strong connection, like you just mentioned, this idea of taking a walk of seeing the world as a new thing. Uh, I just came back from a vacation to a place I'd never been, been before, and it just I had that sense of wonder for the first time in a couple of years to seeing something new, and I think that it really to, you know brought that to my eyes and said, like, I don't see my life like this all the time. Like I had to literally like you know travel the country to do so, which seems silly because I feel like that could happen more often now. So how, how do we make that shift then? Instead of you know, traveling across the world to see new things, like how do we see our day-to-day lives in a fresh way? Yeah, so it's, I think the answer to your question is not an either or, it's a yes and. We try to have a whole lot of travel experiences with our kids. Some of those experiences are 15 minutes away to a cool hike. Others are a couple hours away to a nice little place somewhere in the Midwest. Others are flat around somewhere to the in the United States, or we've taken our kids to you know around the world. Why? Because it's kind of a pain to travel with kids. Because when you see a new part of the world, whether it's 15 minutes away or a 15 hour flight away, you yourself are changed afterwards and you remain changed. So travel, and again, you don't need to hop on a flight to travel, but travel can be a really cool way to see life differently. So do travel. Do take a new ride. You know, most of us go to the office if we travel to the office in the exact same path every single day of our lives. Go a new route. Watch what happens. You you see life differently. So that's really important to continually try to take a new route in life. The second way that I think you can see life through that childlike lens of awe is to imagine, again, that everything you see is indeed a miracle. And some of us might be crossing our arms a little bit to this right now, but we did some research on this, okay? Okay. The likelihood of you being simply born to your mother and your father. If you ask yourself, man, what's the chance of mom going to the mixer and and dad leaving steak and shake a little bit early? So he ended up at the dance, too, and they met eyes across the room. What's the chance of this? And then what's the chance biologically of this thing actually working out just right for Jeff Sanders to arrive on the scene? What's the chance? And, you know, I don't know, one in a thousand, not one in a million. The real answer, and this should have us pause every day, is it's less than one in 400 trillion. So so the wow. fact that you are merely alive to be on this podcast today or to tune into it is nothing short of a freaking shocking miracle. And many of us go through life pissed. The, the Starbucks line took forever this morning. The coffee came out cold, t- t- too black, too light. When you recognize that life is nothing short of a miracle, it, it then changes your experiences throughout that day. And that then everything that comes out of it is also a miracle. The fact that somebody was you know, working in a Colombian field, drawing that coffee from the plant, from the fields into the areas where they collect them, then refine them, then transport them to meet you where you are in your drive through wherever you're tuning in from today. It's, to use Jeff's word, it is awesome. So yeah, go, go abroad, go on a hike, see life differently. 
but don't wait for that next vacation to recognize the gift that is in front of you right now. And frequently, Jeff, final thing I'll say on this is the gifts that we miss most frequently are the ones directly in front of us, not only in a cup of coffee, but you mentioned your three-year-old girl in, in a partner or a spouse in where you live and the freedoms you have and the opportunity to worship or not. In all of these gifts, the ability to see and hear and taste and learn, these are magnificent gifts. So don't don't wish them away. Embrace this moment. I feel like most people just don't see the world like you do, the way you just described it. I mean, I have viewed myself as a fairly positive person most of my life, and I know that that's not the case for other people. I mean, I'm just traveling been in airports the last couple of days. Like, I've seen a lot of people who don't view life that way. And I think it's interesting that it feels like this must be an intentional choice that's somewhere on the line to say, like, I'm going to, you know, from this day forward, I'm not going to see the negative or I'm not going to let that get to me. Like, did you make a choice like this? Did you, you have or, or habits to keep that up? Like, how do you maintain positivity like that? Right. So the answer again is yes. And it is a choice and it's a continual choice. And while you were asking the question, I was thinking over this weekend, my boys and I have, I have four kids, three boys and one little girl. We watch Dead Poets Society and my boys are a little young. So they were a little bored during periods of this movie with the great Robin Williams, this phenomenal teacher. But there's a scene where he draws these bored, arrogant, self-assured kids. And by the way, you don't need to be at a prestigious uh, school like they were at to be bored by life, to be self-assured, to yawn your way through your experiences. I think many of us are at risk of going through that same kind of existence. He drew them close to the trophy case. And rather than showing them the magnificent trophies and how phenomenal the school is, he had them look at the faces and he reminded them that they are all now fertilizing the fields. And then he started whispering some wisdom to them. And the wisdom he said was, you know, boys, Carpe diem, carpe diem, boys, seize the day, seize the day. As we age, I think we know this as children, like little kids, one, two, three, four, five, but we begin aging away from that. We stop seizing the day as frequently as we age. Lots of reasons for that. But again, as we return toward our childlike behavior later on, we return to it oftentimes. You'll see grandparents. You'll, you'll see your aged aunt or uncle who doesn't care what they wear. They don't care that they sing out of cue. They, they, they don't worry about being judged. They are passionately living this moment unapologetically, unapologetically. In other words, they're seizing the day. So it is a choice we make through omission and commission. And ultimately, the way you make it and you frame this beautifully in the question is to be highly intentional. So Man, for me, I, I have every morning about an hour of reflective time. Part of that is prayer. Um, part of it is journaling. I have a little gratitude journal. Every morning I begin my day with a tall cup of coffee or tea, or definitely a water, on the screen porch with the question, why me? And I just spend time reflecting on what I'm grateful for then. And Jeff, sometimes it's, it's taking an inventory of the blessings in front of me. But what this thing frequently becomes, and this is really cool, I think, is oftentimes it becomes love letters. I'll write letters to my kids or my wife or my parents who are both struggling with their health right now. To my grandmother, before she passed away, she received a lot of love letters from her grandson. To clients and prospective clients and neighbors and community leaders. I, I want people to know that I see the good work that they are doing and I'm grateful for it. And one of the cool benefits of that is it's not only being something that changes your life and the way you show up in the day, but then in no small ways, it begins to change the lives of those around you that you are called to serve and elevate. Yeah, I feel like that's that's a tricky one. And actually, it actually brought me to my, my next question because I was just thinking about this like line of positive thinking and living uh, in a quiet time by yourself in the morning and the daily habits when you get to places, let's say if like you're going to the office and you have coworkers and you have these challenges of, you know, other people don't see the world that you do, or you want to bring that childlike wonder to the place where you're, you know, spending most of your time every day, how do you translate that childlike wonder to I mean, a very adultish kind of place of, of, of existence? I feel like there might be a lot of resistance to that. It's like how do you, I guess, embody that in places where people expect a different type of behavior? So I think we're all trying to figure out who we are. And maybe rather than that, it's 
the question you could be asking yourself is who were you before the world told you who you were or what mm. matter or what success is or how to get innovation or how to make a check or how to get followers or grow podcast listeners or whatever, whatever the thing is that many of us are measuring ourselves and our version of success by. So who were you before the world told you who you should become? And I think the more you can be incredibly authentic to that, like wildly authentic to that calling, some in the world, no doubt about it, will push you away and say, I find that repulsive. Okay, fine. It wasn't meant to be. But then there will be others who find this incredibly attractive. They will find it as a great differentiator and they will want to become more part of your sphere of influence, more part of your, your system of influence. And so you're asking the question, how do you do this? I don't think it's in the words you use frequently. I don't think it's in the questions you ask, although that's, those are two powerful ways. I don't think it's in your brainstorming sessions or the wisdom of your, your writings. It's in the way that you show up day after day after day when no one's looking because they are, they are looking and the way you show up will set you apart from everybody else. That kind of reminds me of my last day job. I've worked myself now for the last seven years. And prior to that, I had a job where I had to go kind of back and forth in the office a lot. And so I, and I walked quickly. I was always like in a hurry wherever I was going. And people would stop me and be like, you know, why are you in a hurry? Like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. The next most important thing. I was like excited to get to it. And I feel like to a certain degree, like that's in a sense, like my version of doing that a while ago. Um, I haven't done that quite as much recently working in my house. But I feel like there is this sense of like, like when you are doing what you're talking about here, like being authentic, having this sense of I don't know, energy, enthusiasm for life, like it does show up. People do kind of peg that and they'll ask you about it, which is interesting that they, in the very least to, yeah, to at least have those experiences to say like, I'm going to, to be myself and then it works out well. We, you know, we partner with Apple and Microsoft and Southwest. So there are some fairly significant businesses that get the power of this. But one of my, my favorite groups, we, Marines. So we partner with the Marine Corps and also special forces. Uh, what I've always noticed about great leadership is they seldom walk with their shoulders slumped and they seldom meander. That doesn't mean when they're not working that they don't go to a park and just chill or have a beer at night or a glass of wine or have coffee in the morning and, and find that time to reflect and breathe again. But I think great leaders, to your point earlier, when, when you were working organizationally, your pace actually sets you apart because many of us uh, meander. Life is kind of boring and it's, it, you know, it's kind of hard and it hasn't really been fair to me. And I probably should have got the promotion six months ago, not him, not her. So when they see someone whose shoulders are back and are moving in the direction of their true north, it does beg the question, where is that person going? You know, like it, what sets that person apart? What a cool way to be different than everybody else, to be even more laser focused, more mission focused. And, and along those same lines, like who do you look up to or how are you trying to to grow yourself in terms of, you know, who are people that you think like, you know, if I could be more like this person, more along the lines of uh, have more of their energy, more of their enthusiasm. Like, are there people you tend to lean on as far as like, you know, this is a good mentor for me? Yeah. So mentor is a great word and also role model. And, and those are sometimes different. So I view a mentor as someone who's actually part of your life and actively engaged with you. And I have a, a group of board members. Rusty Keeley being the president of this board, but a business owner, a, a philanthropist, a hard charger, a, a faithful guy, a good a husband, a great dad. He's all these things, but he's an awesome role model and mentor of mine. So I have a lot of folks like that, ladies and gentlemen, who I mentored by and look up to. But then on the role model side, so in my office, if you were physically with me right now as we record this, you would see behind me. Uh, a picture of my wife and me on our wedding night. You, you'd see to the left and the right of that, her mom and dad, and then my mom and dad. You'd see my grandparents and her grandparents. You'd see five of my siblings, uh, four of my kids, generations, man, a lot of travel pictures too, by the way, taking us back to an earlier conversation. A lot of the pictures on the wall are from travel experiences with my family. Every one of them motivate me and they shape the way I show up. They are why I work so hard, but they're also why I get home for dinner. So that's my why wall behind the camera, behind this recording device that you and I are on right now, it's my podcast wall. So I have a podcast called Live Inspired with John O'Leary. These are people who have profoundly influenced my life and they serve as like, man, I wish I could be like that. I'm looking at a picture right now with a guy and a, a space shuttle behind him. His name is Jim Lavelle. Jim Lavelle is the one who uttered the words, Houston, 
we have a problem. Mm-hmm. He was the guy who flew Apollo 13. And people know that story. And it's a crazy good story of engineering, of human beings not giving up, of resiliency, of faithfulness, and of landing this thing together. It's really a cool story. But maybe the better story is that he grew up in the Great Depression without a dad, that he flunked out of the Navy flight school twice, that he tried to land on the aircraft three times before he was successful landing on the aircraft carrier, that he tried to get into the Gemini program and failed out of that. So I'm I'm looking at a picture in front of me of a a huge failure in life who failed his way forward, who failed his way forward. There's a guy right below him named Andre Norman. Andre Norman is a convicted felon. He is a man who, was achieved, who achieved the status of being a criminal at age 18, was sent away for 25 years. While in jail, he incited nine different riots and attempted to murder cellmates twice. This is a very bad dude, bad guy, who then changed. There was a psychologist who got a hold of him. There were two rabbis who got into his life. There were three little Catholic nuns who talked about grace and forgiveness. And this man started to imagine a different life for him. He started to imagine one day being able to let go of his childhood demons, of being able to go through life without anger, having a big vision, and one day learning how not only to read, but to teach at Harvard. Like, that's crazy. And yet last time I had lunch with Andre, we we practically fought over the lunch bill. This is a man who has served as an adjunct professor at Harvard. He is no no longer in penitentiary. He spends his life going around to schools, teaching these kids how not to go down his path, that there is another avenue. And when he's not doing that, he's actually behind bars teaching these guys that one day if they decide to change, it's got to be them. It's got to be them. It's not just a system. It's not just the warden. It's not just their stupid parents or their lack of parents. It's got to be them. They've got a choice to choose. And he wanted to share with them how they can indeed do this. So, man, this wall is filled with people who are just incredibly inspirational and inform why, in spite of challenges, I want to do better, man. So, Jeff, those are some of the influences in my life. Yeah, that, that's powerful. I love that. Um, and we actually brought up a, a question, I guess a follow-up question to that guy's story of getting to Harvard at, at, you know, later in life. There are, I guess, moments we all have where we feel like we've been in a rut, we've been stagnant, we've I mean, maybe been in prison, we've had those challenges, and then we change. But what causes that change? Like, how do you shift from, you know, I've been down this path for such a long time, it's just kind of defined who I am, but I want to be someone new. Like, wh- how do you get out of that rut to, to start that new path forward? So there's a, one of my buddies, his, his name is Dave Rams, and he teaches people how to become financially free. And it begins really with you taking responsibility for your life. And then you work and slowly through the snowball effect, building this thing of baby step one, two, three, four, until not only are you debt free, but you're able to live generously with what you have. So it's not a popular thing except by those who go through this process and their lives are changed afterwards. And so he's frequently asked that question. And his answer is when you finally are able to yell out to anybody in the room and sometimes yourself that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, that's when. Whether you are an alcoholic or you're too far in debt or you're on your fifth marriage or you're unhealthy, you're making the wrong decisions physically or spiritually or professionally or whatever it might be, that you are done being done. That's finally when you can look up and and not only realize there is a different direction to go, but there are people who have walked that path. One of the great leadership organizations in the world is AA. They've changed more lives than, than just about any other organization. And there's lots of ways they do that, but taking people through step by step in community, in community. So for those of us listening right now who are like, man, I, I, I wish I had a little more positivity or I wish I had a better relationship at home or any relationship at home. I wish I had a different relationship with my kids or with my aging parents or with my sense of self or my health or my, my wellness, whatever it might be. Uh, the good news is there is someone out there that has journeyed the same path that you are longing for. So step number one, realize you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Step number two, look around for help. Step number number three, ask. And if you can't find that person, call me. I'm, I'm online, man. Go to, go to Google Live Inspired with John O'Leary. You'll find us. My number is listed. And our job, in addition to speaking and writing books and doing podcasts and coaching, is really to help people meet their next right step, to take the next best step along their journey forward. 
I love that. That's fantastic. I think that's an incredible thing. I, I love what you said about this idea of, of going step by step in community. Cause I feel like, you know, this podcast is focused a lot on productivity and, and checking boxes and going step by step through goals. But I think that that aspect of going through these, this process in community is something I know I personally have struggled with for a long time in terms of having the right people around me. I feel like that when I've had that, it has been so transformative. How do you think that people go about forming a great community of people around them and having, you know, maybe like-minded people or those that challenge them to move forward. Like, how do you get that sense of community if, if you don't have that now? Dude, I'm so glad you asked because no matter what you asked there, I was going to suggest that answer, you know, like, because <laughs> to me, if I'm listening, I'm thinking, well, dude, how do I do that? So great question, Jeff. And t- two things. Number one is if you don't have any community, that's all right. You are not alone. There was a, a study done by Gallup two years ago that said 64% of us, that's more than a majority, 64% of us feel as if we have no one to share truth with. Uh, mm. And that means many of us who are married don't have someone to share truth with. Many of us who are parents have little ones, don't feel like you have someone to share truth with. Many of our children don't feel like they have someone to look up to and share their truth with. This is a chronic issue. What it has led to is greater anxiety. I I think it has led to far greater isolation, which leads no doubt to despair, discouragement, and eventually depression. So the the pandemic was here long before COVID-19 arrived on our shores. So just be aware of that. So how do you battle back against this? Recognize, number one, you you are not alone. There are others looking also for connection, togetherness, truly belonging. Uh, Serve. If you're looking, man, where do I even begin that? Serve. You know, like start volunteering somewhere. You would be amazed how many organizations, how many volunteer organizations in particular are needing human beings to show up and make a difference. So if one of your passions is the environment, pick up trash some Saturday. You're going to meet some great guys, great ladies, great leaders. If your passion's faith, get more involved in your synagogue, temple, or church. If your passion's children, look at all the summer camps that are taking place right now around, around the world. If you really want to get involved and change a life, volunteer with Big Brothers Big Sisters. I'm an ambassador. I'm an active big. My family are bigs. We believe the way you change the world is one life at a time. And the best way to do that, I believe, is big brothers, big sisters. The way you change, though, is not the child's life. It's actually yours. You're the one being changed. So that if you have no network, that's where I recommend your, your leaders might begin. You know, start in your own backyard with something that interests you. For those that already have a cell phone filled with names, like you guys, man, I, I wanted to grow and have better years going forward. I wanted to be far more intentional in my marriage, my business, and my finances. So I remember a couple of years ago, and I've never written about this, but so here's a story I've never shared. I sent out a text to 10 guys in my community that I love. I think are great leaders. I think they're good guys. They're good guys. So I said, hey, guys, uh, 2017 was a good year, but I want 28 to be, 2018 to be even better. If you want your year to be better, meet me at on my backyard tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock, coffee and bagels on me. So I sent that out to 10 the day before. It's New Year's Eve. On uh, New Year's, and yes, some of them might have been a little groggy from the night before, 7 a.m., there were 13 guys that showed up. I invited hmm. 10. The need is out there. The desire for connection is out there. So throw a little bait in the water. Be authentic about it, and then make sure you sustain them afterwards. Don't, don't just make this a one-off, but make sure it's a, a, a relationship, not a drive-by. That is awesome. I love that. That's a fantastic story right there. John, this is this has been amazing today. You're you're so inspiring. I just I love the, the stories, the examples and, and the practicality uh, of your advice here. I think it's 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 amazing. Um so obviously I, I want our listeners to dig into your content more to get a copy of your book. Um where can they go to learn more from you? Awesome. So and me, like one thing you guys should know before you write down this address is when I wrote my first book, it was it's called On Fire. And the publisher created the cover art for it. They sent it to me. And it was a picture of John O'Leary wearing a suit and tie with his arms crossed, looking very (laughs) stoically and tough at the camera person. Almost like modeling, like, listen, people, I'm kind of a big deal. And if you want to be a big deal, follow me. So I wrote back and said, hey, guys, did you read the book? Because it's not about me. This is about human beings showing up in whatever role they find themselves, doing their best work possible, and in doing so changing the world one life at a time. That's what this book is about. So when they came back with the cover art, it's now no picture of me on the front or back. The words on fire are in embossed, beautiful, brilliant, fiery letters. 
and they're actually made out of this expensive ink called coil, like our foil. It, it's, it reflects the image of the reader back, meaning you're the expert, you're the star, you're the hero, act like it. So that, that, that's, that's the goal of not only that book, but all of our work, all of our work. So just recognize if you want to learn more about John, ultimately, you're going to learn a lot more about you. That's, that's a, what I'm after. Okay. So you can visit me at readinawe.com. It's one big long word, read, I-N, awe. So readinawe.com. And when you're there, you know, there's links to our social media, to our Live Inspired podcast, to the book On Fire and In Awe. And there's a link to a 21-day hope. It's free, but a a 21-day hope challenge. So readinawe.com. Okay, perfect. I'll be sure those links are available for listeners this week on the show notes page. And uh, John, once again, you blow me away. This has been so much fun. And uh, next time we'll talk about the Cardinals and how terrible our baseball team is. But uh, we can do that another time. <laughs> Jeff, as a man of hope and faith, I believe that even even after what happened last night, you and I are recording this after a painful loss. Yes. Uh, I believe better days are in front of us. And uh, let's show up at the ballpark again tonight. Love that. Perfect. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks, Jeff. And for that great action step this week, rediscover your childlike wonder. Of course, the best way to make that happen is to get a copy of John O'Leary's book, In All. You know, John is an incredibly inspiring man, and there's so much value to be gained from tapping into your own sources of inspiration, hope, and joy. So make that happen this week. JeffSanders.com slash 403 is the place to go to get the episode notes. Also, go to 5AMMiracle.com to join the 5AM Club and get free email updates about the show. That's all I've got for you here on the 5AM Miracle Podcast this week. Until next time, you have the power to change your life. And the fun begins bright and early.